Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Beth Kennard, Elizabeth Kennard, MD. I'm one of the docs at Ohio Reproductive Medicine. We are a comprehensive infertility clinic and IVF center. And tonight I'm just here to chat with you, answer any questions, sort of you get me and you can pick my brain about anything that you're concerned about or worried about and want to talk to somebody about on the internet. So go for it. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I think we should talk about is some of the myths of infertility. These are things you might have heard or you might have read, or most importantly, I think things that very well meaning, probably kind people who care about you will say to you that will just about break your heart. <laughs> and um, so let's talk about them. One of the biggest things I think we should talk about is when somebody will say to you that if you would just stop worrying about it, then you would get pregnant. And that usually makes people feel pretty bad because it sounds like it's your fault that you're not getting pregnant. And I just wanna tell you that we don't really think that worrying about it makes people have infertility. We actually think it's the infertility that gets you all stressed out. There's plenty of evidence that stress doesn't really cause infertility unless it makes you stop having sex or stop having periods. All right. So don't let anybody tell you it's your fault and don't let them make you feel bad. Okay. I've got a question here that says, what's the ballpark time frame from establishing a new patient to starting IVF? Well, it's a really uh, it's a really good question, but it's kind of hard to answer because it's very individualized. You know, when you come to see us at Ohio Reproductive Medicine for your first appointment, it's a getting to know you session. And a lot of people will come in here and they're just at the beginning of this journey and they haven't done any kind of evaluation and they haven't had any prior treatment. And in that case, you know, it's unlikely, it's possible, but it's unlikely that I would start you into an IVF cycle, an in vitro fertilization cycle, the minute that I meet you. Um, usually that type of person, it, there would probably be a sense of a set of evaluation tests that would be done. And then depending on the results, we may or may not recommend in vitro right away. But on the other hand, if the question is, how the heck long does it take to start doing IVF with us? If you know that's what you need and you're coming in the door ready to go, it will probably take about four to six weeks before you would actually be starting the treatment. There's just some preliminary testing and things like that that we have to get taken care of before we get started. It's not really too long considering the journey that most of you have already been on, but that's the answer. If you were ready to go, it would still take a little bit of time. Okay. All right. I've got another question here. It says, what are the first line treatments for female infertility? Well, typically the first line of treatment is a pretty simple and pretty inexpensive treatment. And that would involve using some long established medications that are in a form of a pill. They've been around for years and they're not terribly expensive and they're pretty easy to take. You just take them for a few days. And we might or might not also begin with uh, intrauterine inseminations. We sometimes shorten that to IUI. Infertility caregivers, we love to give things nicknames, and I'm going to try not to try not to do that. But um, so we would do inseminations potentially and use these um, medications that I mentioned. That would usually be the first line treatment. But as always. Treatments are very individualized and not that wouldn't be appropriate for all of the people that we see. So first, you have to have a, an evaluation. It doesn't take that long, but there's some basic you know, tests that we need to do. All right, let's see. I got another question from Anonymous. Okay. You had a failed cycle at another clinic and I'm not happy there. What are the steps to transfer to you? It's easy to come and see us. You just call up and make an appointment. You don't need a referral. You don't need anybody's permission. You can just come and see us. Uh, the number is 614-451-2280. And we're also actually really easy to get to. Our location is right by the intersection of a bunch of highways and very easy. 
So no, no issues. Anybody, we're open to seeing anybody. No referrals, no problems. We can always get your records to look at, and we don't necessarily need to repeat things that have done before. We're just going to try to hit the ground running and make things better for you. Okay? I hope to see you soon. <laughs> All right, I have another anonymous attendee's question, which is, do I have any recommendation to increase the chances for an IUI cycle? So IUI, intrauterine insemination. Yeah, so IUI is pretty well studied and it has a very similar success rate in um, most situations. It's gonna be usually between 10 and 20, 10 to, between 10 and 20% per cycle. It might be a little bit lower than that if the woman's quite a bit older or if the sperm count's quite low. Um, but we really don't have any specific other recommendations beyond the obvious of not putting drugs and chemicals into your body and not smoking. Uh, we don't have magic vitamin supplements or special things that we could recommend. If If I knew if I knew, I would already have to, I would tell everyone, I would shout it from the rooftop. So we don't know specifically beyond, you know, the basic healthful living that, that would increase the pregnancy rate. All right. So another person's writing her personal story. She's had three failed transfers, did all testing. Is there still a chance to get pregnant? Oh, absolutely. There's still a chance in most cases. We just don't understand everything about that magical implantation where we put embryos into the uterus and they don't always implant or they miscarry, which is also just terrible to go through. Most of the time, if a person can make healthy embryos, there is always a chance for pregnancy. Um, getting a different protocol would be something to discuss with your caregiver as to whether or not they think shifting things around might be a good idea. And there are also some tests that people do sometimes and treatments that people do sometimes for repeated failed implantations. It's a little bit too much to get into on Facebook Live, but it's a, it's a very um, important area. I'm so sorry you've gone through that. I know it's heartbreaking and I wish that I had more solid evidence of the exact uh, solution to your problem, but I don't, I don't also know all your details. Okay, so here's another person. I'm sorry, I just have to read for a minute. This is a long one. <laughs> So this person is writing in and basically saying, you know, I'm older and I don't know how long I should be trying before I would need to be getting uh, looked at. And so there's a pretty standard answer for that. So if you are over 35, you should try for about six months before you seek evaluation. And if you're under 35, a whole year. And boy, that can be a long year. I know. <laughs> um, however, there is one um, qualification there. If you're a woman who does not have really regular cycles, you can't figure out when your fertile time is and your periods aren't happening or they aren't happening regularly, you, you don't need to wait. But if you are, if you're having regular cycles and you're um, trying to get pregnant, humans are just not very good at getting pregnant <laughs> and it can be very normal to take a few months. So if you're over 35, we would say the six month mark would be the time to get in and get evaluated just to make sure there's nothing serious that's getting in the way of getting pregnant. There isn't a lot of time to uh, fool around with this at that age. All right, so a general cost idea to be seen evaluating the cycle of medications if we assume insurance will pay nothing. Okay. Um, ooh, you know, honestly, my billing manager is always yelling at me for talking about numbers because I don't have the exact numbers and it varies so much from person to person. Um, the first visit to see the doctor is usually in uh, the 300-ish range. Please don't hold me to any of these exact numbers, but to give you some idea. And then if we would order a 
um, a test of the fallopian tubes, the called the HSG, that would be $1,000. And the blood work would be whatever the lab charges, I really don't know. And then an IUI in our office, you asked about a medication cycle, IUI cycle. IUI is about $500. So I hope that gives you some idea of the costs involved of those sorts of things. Okay, now I have a question about recommendations for what a female can take to help conceive. Oh, okay, like vitamins or supplements. Okay, well, actually, there aren't a lot, as somebody mentioned before, what can I do to make the IUI work? So in general, for promoting fertility, we, we know only this these very basic things for sure. We know that if you are overweight, it will often take a little bit longer to get pregnant and you'll have a little bit higher miscarriage rate. So being normal weight is very healthful and very helpful. Uh, we also, of course, don't recommend that you smoke or do cannabis or other drugs. And as far as your prescription medications, we recommend that you would talk to your prescriber about them. For example, if you are on a medication for high blood pressure, there's some that we would prefer that you not be on when you get pregnant and others that would be more, more um, acceptable. Um, and then in terms of what else to do, we suggest that you take a vitamin, a basic prenatal vitamin. You can get those over the counter. There isn't one brand that's magic. Uh, any basic prenatal vitamin will give you the nutrition that we optimize that you want to have in order to conceive. Uh, for the guy, again, the same sorts of things. Healthful living is a very good place to start. And then um, there are, there is very little evidence that there is a big contribution to vitamin and supplement therapy for guys in normal fertility situations. If you knew that a guy had a low sperm count, there are some antioxidant vitamin blends, fertility blends for uh, men. Those are um, easy to find if you were to search. They're um, CoQ10 and some B vitamins that some people feel will make a small difference. Um, okay, so that's that. And then how many times, okay, this these are very specific questions. Good job, guys. Um, how many times would you generally advise doing IUIs before moving on to IVF? Well, <laughs> this is a very general answer because these, these decisions are very individual, but there's an overall idea that you should probably not do intrauterine insemination treatments for more than a few months. And if you do not achieve a pregnancy, it becomes less likely to happen. If you have a pregnancy with a miscarriage, it sort of resets the clock and you can do that for a few more months and reasonably expect a pregnancy. But depending on the situation, usually the number is three or four months. Sometimes in a very young person who isn't ovulating and is doing the medicine and the insemination as a extra, um, maybe up to six months, but usually the number is three or four months. So the next question is a really good one. And the next one is, can IVF help me even if I'm not getting my period every month? Yes, IVF could probably help you as long as, and this is going to be a scary thing to say. I don't think this is the case for most of our patients, but people that we see who aren't getting their period are usually not getting their period because they're not ovulating, but they still have eggs. Sometimes we see people who are actually in an early menopause. And if that's the case, which isn't usually, then IVF won't help. But if you're like most of our patients and you just don't have regular cycles, uh, we have treatments that we would recommend before IVF, usually, um, with those medicines that I mentioned, those fertility drugs that can sometimes induce you or make you start to ovulate, and that would make the cycles come back, and you might not even need to do IVF. But otherwise, certainly IVF would be an alternative treatment for somebody who doesn't have regular periods. 
Um, usually though, we try the other stuff first and save the IVF for the people for whom that other treatment was not successful. Ah, do I, do you have to stop breastfeeding if you want to go through another egg retrieval and transfer? We prefer that you do uh, because the hormones involved with breastfeeding sometimes interfere with ovulation and the hormones will also transfer to the breast milk and therefore get to your baby. So we would prefer that you wean the baby before going through another egg retrieval. And congratulations, <laughs> if you have a baby that you're breastfeeding, that's great. Okay. Now I have a very specific question from a woman who's talking about the thickness of her endometrium, which is the lining of the inside of the uterus. And she has a measurement here. And uh, the measurement that she's listed of 6.2 centimeter uh, millimeters, that, that is uh, thinner than average. Um, with, without, without knowing a lot more about this individual, it's hard to tell you um, more answers. It, I don't know why it was measured. I don't know what medication you were on, if any. And the day of the cycle that you wrote here is not the day that it's usually looked at. So it's a little bit difficult for me to give you good advice. Um, I, I'd recommend that whoever ordered the ultrasound would know more about your whole story and where, where you, what you were doing when, in terms of treatment or not, when it was done. Maybe, uh, maybe run that question by them. I just don't have enough information to answer it. Sorry. Oh, uh, I'm so, so sorry. I have a message from someone who just had a miscarriage at 15 weeks. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that happened to you. How long would I recommend you wait before starting IVF again? Well, um, medically speaking, you can probably start treatment again as soon as your cycles come back. I do think that can be either very healing as you start to take some action to recover from your grief, but it also could be traumatic given what you've gone through. So take good care of yourself and make sure that you're ready. But as far as how fast can you get back to the clinic, usually as soon as you get your period, your doctor will probably want to meet with you, probably want to check your uterus, do some preliminary tests, and then you could probably do another cycle. And I hope, I hope, I hope that it turns out better for you the next time. Again, someone, um, somebody came in and asked me, how long does it take to do IVF again? Hi, you must uh, have not been here a few minutes ago. That's okay. Um, I, I did say it does depend on the situation. Not every new patient needs IVF, but once the decision to make um, a move to do IVF is made, it usually takes about one cycle to get everything ready, usually. Um, there is some blood work, there is some consents. We do have to send information to the insurance company and maybe we get a rejection, but we do have to send it to them. And then it has to be a certain time in your cycle before we can start an IVF. So generally it's gonna be about a month before you would be able to start. Okay, we're going in another direction here about egg freezing. Very good, really, really thinking about freezing eggs. I am very happy that this came up. It's a hot topic these days. Um, and how long does it take to get that process started and um, what kind of lab work and things? So you're, we do freeze eggs for people for elective reasons. We also freeze it you know, for a future fertility for people who are facing a cancer diagnosis. And, um, but if it's being done for elective reasons, you know, you're worried about having kids in the future and getting older and wanting to sort of preserve some chances, you would come in for a consultation with us. 
we would generally order uh, some lab work that would be done at a you know a certain point in your cycle and again probably within four to six weeks if you're in a big hurry and you want to go quickly which is what most of our patients are it's probably going to take something along that time frame it's it's not long it's usually more or less one cycle but we just have to also, you have to be starting meds at a certain point, and when you arrive in the office, it's probably not uh, possible to start that week, and also, you might not be at the right point in your cycle, but pretty quickly, and I don't think you have to wait too long to get a new patient appointment here. I don't think it's more than a few weeks. We have four doctors here at Ohio Reproductive Medicine, and, and we're all, of course, ready to see new patients anytime. Uh, if you do not have a cycle that mean you are no longer ovulating or could there be another issue? Well, most of the time, if you're not bleeding, it means that you're not ovulating. Not always. Uh, there are a couple of other less common reasons. For example, one of them would be some kind of scarring um, inside the uterus. Um, in order for that to happen, you usually would have had some kind of surgical procedure or something, some kind of really bad infection. Um, the other thing that un, unlikely but also possible is an early menopause, unexpected menopause. Uh, typically that person is also experiencing hot flashes and other symptoms of menopause. So most commonly, in fact, it is what you suggested. It's that the woman is not ovulating. Now, sometimes women stop ovulating regularly because they have developed a hormone imbalance or insulin resistance as a result of weight gain. Uh, sometimes they've got another complete issue like problems with their thyroid gland. It's That's a different hormone than a reproductive hormone, but it can still have an effect. So to start with, a person in that situation would come in and get evaluated. There would be some blood work and a, you know, an exam, and then we would go from there. Oh, <laughs> well, whoever Maggie's parents are, um, thanks for that. Glad to hear you have a little two-year-old and you, um, I don't think that everybody can see what you said. So I'm going to tell you, one of our patients has written, remember everyone, it's a marathon and not a sprint. The lows, the highs, the low lows, trust the process and the science and your doctor. So thanks for that comment and I'll see you soon. Um, do I recommend anything particular with diet while going through IVF? Well, no, not really. We don't recommend that you're on a strict, you know, calorie restricted, um, I'm trying to lose weight diet while you're going through IVF, but we also don't want to make you miserable. So just a normal diet is thought to be fine for somebody experiencing infertility and somebody um who's trying to get pregnant through IVF or any other treatment that we do. Okay, so can I talk about genetic conditions that may be associated with decreased ovarian reserve? Okay, so decreased ovarian reserve is a phrase that means that a person has had some lab tests and the lab tests seem to show that they have less eggs, less reserve in their ovaries than we would expect. And the background for that, and probably everybody that has logged in kind of already knows this because you guys are all very sophisticated, um, but you're born with all the eggs you're ever gonna have in your ovaries. And this is a really terrible story for a reproductive doctor. I don't like this at all, but this is the way it is. Um, we're losing eggs all through our youth and our adulthood until such time as they're gone and then that's menopause. But the pace of the loss of eggs is not something we can really control. Some of it's genetic. And then there are a few things that could affect it in a negative way, like um, smoking um, increases the pace of losing follicles and so does radiation and chemotherapy. But other than that, the most significant contributor is just 
genetics. And by that, I don't mean a specific genetic condition. By that, I mean uh, women who go through puberty early often have children who go through puberty early and women who go through menopause early often have children who go through menopause early. It's not a guarantee either way, but these things tend to run in families. There is a specific genetic condition or it's not really a condition in the woman. It's a, something she carries. It's called a fragile X pre mutation and fragile X is a condition that causes mental retardation, primarily in boys. And the mom is not experiencing any mental retardation. The mom has a what's called a pre-mutation in the X chromosome that then amplifies when she has kids. So it is uh, recommended that if you're experiencing early ovarian failure or very decreased ovarian reserve at a young age, that you consider doing that testing just to find out if you have that gene. There aren't a lot of other genetic conditions that I'm aware of that are associated with significant decreased ovarian reserve. Um, can I explain what happens during IVF? Sure, sure. I'll make it quick because a lot of people here already know all this, but what happens with IVF is just big picture, we're going to stimulate a woman's ovaries with fertility drugs. They're given by injections. I can show you. Here we go. This is one of the types. This is not the only one we would use uh, brand, but basically it's filled with medicine right, right in here. And there's a window here and you dial the dose. And I hope nobody this is going to pass out from seeing a needle, but there's the needle. I don't know if you can see it. Can you guys see? I hope you can see it. Anyway, it's a little tiny needle. And these are very strong medications. Do you remember maybe years ago there were TV shows about people who had, you know, six kids, eight kids, all of that. Um, and they didn't do IVF. They used this treatment that makes lots of eggs. We don't do that often anymore. But this medicine, that's this medicine. You take this medicine. Uh, you have monitoring visits to check how you're responding to it. And then you come in when you're ready and you have multiple eggs developed. You come in into the office here. We give you anesthesia. Uh, we remove the eggs through the vagina. It's not an actual like surgical procedure. There's no um, cutting anything. And then um, after that, you wake up and the rest happens in the lab. And here's a picture. Hope you guys can see it. Um, this is what an egg looks like. And then these are all the stages of embryo development all the way down to that, which is the blastocyst embryo that's ready to implant. So when it's time to get pregnant, we transfer one of those blastocyst embryos and uh, we'll typically freeze the rest of them. So that's just a general idea about what happens during IVF. And as um, people have asked me before, I'll say again, usually if that's what we decide to do, whether it's at your first visit or after you've been with us for a few months, once we decide that together, that that's what we're going to do, it usually takes another month or so before we're actually uh, doing the process, going through the medications and getting ready for the retrieval. Um, the, a person who posted that request also asked me if 42 was too old. And um, it's not too old, but we do see a significant impact of age on the success of IVF. And that has to do with what I said before. We're born with all of our eggs and this terrible story of we're losing them as we get older. And by the time you're 42, most of the eggs are not really great quality. And so as a result, we find that IVF is less likely to work in that age group than in younger age groups. And after age 42, if you get up to 43, 44, 45, honestly, it usually doesn't work. And that is just because of egg quality. No matter what we do, um, we can't replace the eggs uh, that that have already gone. At that age, the only thing we can do is replace the eggs with another woman's eggs, which is called using an egg donor or using donor eggs, which is a whole different topic. 
Um, the cost of an IVF cycle. Well, again, it's uh, difficult to be exact. I don't mean to be evasive. I would think in terms of uh, somewhere around $15,000 if you have no insurance in Ohio, that's around what it costs. That's lab fees and medications, but it will vary from person to person because it depends how you respond and how much of the medicine you need and your unique situation. Um, a person, uh, going back to this egg, aged eggs and ovarian failure, someone has asked me if a person can do an egg retrieval with premature ovarian failure. I'm sorry, I'm reading. <laughs> it says, uh, my husband and I have done a donor egg cycle and resulted in a normal embryo, but we are scared to invest in more donor eggs and have it end with an unsuccessful transfer again. Oh, I'm sorry that happened. Um, an egg retrieval with premature ovarian failure, typically that's not a successful uh, proposition because the diagnosis would mean that there really aren't um, eggs available for us to recruit with the fertility drugs. So we typically don't recommend that you invest in an IVF procedure with that diagnosis. Um, so there's a person posting, um, I had a miscarriage in February, I'm sorry. That was almost a year ago, wow. And ever since then, my cycles have been really heavy and very frequent every 18 days. Should I be worrying about having cycles? Am I ovulating? Should I be alarmed about losing eggs so often? Okay, well, this has a lot of questions in it, but let me start by saying uh, the the fact that you're having a, a cycle or not having a cycle doesn't make you run out of eggs faster or or slower. So let me give you another example. If you put an IUD in, and I know most people watching this aren't, aren't using an IUD, but if you ever did, for example, you might not have had any periods during that time. You didn't save eggs. Uh, for the future. You're, if you use an IUD or you do something where you don't have uh, periods for five years, it doesn't mean you get five more years on the other end. Um, you're going to lose eggs even though you're not cycling. You actually even lose eggs while you're pregnant or breastfeeding, even when you're a child, before you even started having periods. So the period itself doesn't mean you've lost an egg out of your supply directly. Um, the thing is, though, uh, every 18 day very heavy cycles, it's not that's not right. And I think you should see your doctor, your OBGYN and let them know this change has happened. They might want to check your uterus and make sure that there isn't some, oh, I don't know, scar tissue or polyp or fiber or something in there that's causing you to have this happen ever since your miscarriage. And then the other thing would be to check some different hormones to see if you've got an imbalance that's making your cycles go wacky like that, because that's not the way it's supposed to be. And um, and if you want to get pregnant again, this doesn't sound right. So I would recommend that you get evaluated. Yeah. Um, okay, another question about egg freezing. How long? Oh, great question. How long can you keep them? years. <laughs> you can probably keep them a decade. In fact, we don't really know the extent of possibility there. The eggs are stored in liquid nitrogen tanks, and I think that's at something like, I don't know, minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. You could Google it. Liquid nitrogen is really cold, and pretty much all cellular degradation stops. So they have been kept for many years, and it's not a problem for the term for the um, viability or the likelihood of success. But but what happens on the other side of that equation is you or whoever, if you're going to use your eggs in the future, you're getting older. Um, so as a woman gets older and gets into her later 30s and early 40s or even older, if we transfer an egg from when she was younger, a, a, an embryo that came from an egg when she was younger, it's going to have the chance of implantation that goes with the younger age but there will be an increased chance of pregnancy complications just related to being pregnant when you're older. So, you know, a woman in her 40s carrying a baby has a higher rate of 
things like getting high blood pressure or getting diabetes when she's pregnant. So it's important to realize the egg will be fine and the embryo has the same chance of implanting ultimately, uh, but the mom could uh, develop some health challenges if she waits a long time. Okay, um, can you go over an AMH FSH for women around 38? Uh, well, I can tell you that when you're 38 years old, the uh, 50th percentile for your AMH level is 1.49. Um, but it's important to know that you can't use an AMH level to predict your chances for getting pregnant if you're not experiencing infertility. And I don't know the person who posted this, I don't know their whole situation. But it's not a very helpful test just to do out of the blue in a woman who's not having infertility. It's specifically valid for predicting whether or not they'll respond well to an IVF cycle. Um, usually we're very happy with AMHs over two and we're pretty happy with them if they're anything over one um, in terms of our expectations for having a decent chance at getting a good amount of eggs at the egg retrieval. The FSH level, follicle stimulating hormone level is a little less sensitive than the AMH level. And that is the opposite in that we want the AMH to be high on the higher end, but we want the FSH to be lower and we prefer it to be under 10 um, at, at any age. It's going to give you a better chance with an IVF cycle if that level is on the lower side. And what it basically relates to is how many eggs we think we'll get during a procedure. And it's kind of a numbers game. If you get more eggs, you ultimately are gonna have more opportunities to transfer a, an embryo, and that's gonna lead to more opportunities for pregnancies. Okay, so I've got a question from someone saying, I had an internal ultrasound, the results are always in conclusive regarding how many eggs I have, but I have a period, so I'm assuming they're there. Uh, okay, yeah. If you're not taking any hormone medications and you're having a period, then I would also conclude that you definitely have eggs. And uh, it's important to know that we can't do an ultrasound and figure out how many eggs you have left because they're, they're one cell. An egg is one cell and you can't count the number of eggs that are in an ovary by doing an ultrasound. You, you, there really isn't any good way to do it. So we have those blood tests that we use for infertility patients that give us some idea of how a woman will respond to IVF treatment, but there isn't a good way to do an ultrasound and say, oh, you know what, you've got 10 more years before you need to worry about infertility. There isn't really a good way to do that. But yeah, you are right. If you are cycling, then I would assume as well that you have eggs. Okay, I have another question about egg freezing. This is great. Uh, do you need to take prenatal care if you're freezing your eggs? Um, so you don't need to see an obstetrician for prenatal visits or prenatal care if you're going to freeze your eggs. We do think it's probably a good idea to just to take a vitamin. We often tell people to take a prenatal vitamin, but probably if you're eating a normal healthy diet, that's not very critical either. Um, so no, you don't have to see your OBGYN. You don't have to have prenatal visits until you're pregnant. You don't have to do any of that stuff while you're freezing your eggs. Okay, I got a question about a guy. That's that's the first one. And it's, it's what time is it? It's already like 7.40, 7.40. And I, and I have a question about a guy. Um, is 47 years old too old for a man to help conceive a baby? Nope. <laughs> nope. Uh, we all know that. Uh, there are cases of people, famous people, um, actors and uh, politicians and other people who have fathered children when they are older. It's a definite truth that an older man can continue to have children at an age where a woman would have great difficulty. Um, at a certain point when a man gets older and that is getting up into that age range, 
there is actually going to be a little bit higher rate of abnormal sperm and potentially therefore a little bit higher miscarriage rate, but uh, 47 years old is still okay for most men to try to conceive a baby. Is there a way to, okay, this is a question about going back to IVF and requesting multiple pregnancy. Do we only transfer one embryo? Um, we don't recommend transferring multiple embryos uh, because there is a risk of a multiple pregnancy. And I know you're thinking, duh, that's why I'm asking for it. I want twins. <laughs> I know uh, most of my patients tell me they would love that. Um, but I think the issue is that if you look at it from the perspective of a potential parent who's been struggling to have kids, the idea of getting two at once is such a blessing. And so, you know, so if I have to buy two car seats and put two kids through college and won't sleep for the first two years of my life, I don't care. This would be so great. And I, and I get that. Um, we look at it from the perspective of what's best for the babies and, and the pregnancy itself. And when you are pregnant with more than one baby, that is not what's best for them. There is a higher rate of miscarriage, a higher rate of malformations, a higher rate of every pregnancy complication that there can be for the mom and the babies if you have an extra baby in the uterus. And it gets worse with each additional one. And so while I agree with you that it would be great to have two full-term babies and have two years of sleepless nights, that would be great. I wish that, you know, would happen for everybody in one sense. My, our concern is that that is not what happens with all multiple pregnancies. And it's uh, doubly hurtful when that does happen. So typically we do not respond to requests for an elective multiple pregnancy attempt. We don't do that under most circumstances. There are a few times uh, where, and, and by the way, we're not making that up. There are guidelines from the American Fertility Society, and there are guidelines from the American College of OBGYN, and nobody who does obstetrics, gynecology, and fertility thinks multiple pregnancies are beneficial to the, to the babies. Um, it's not recommended. So we didn't just, we're not just trying to be, uh, controlling grumpy people. <laughs> but um, we will sometimes transfer more than one embryo into a woman if she has had multiple failed transfers, at least two, or if she is older and she has not done genetic testing on the embryos, she's over 38 and she has not tested the embryos. So we do not know if they are normal. Under those circumstances, we have transferred more than one embryo. <laughs> okay, well, Rocco's parents, hi, congratulations. Nice to see you. Um, is 48 year old, 48 too old to conceive a baby for a man? Does that make his sperm count go down? Well, it's not a lot different than the 47 year old. So 48, 40, a man can usually um, continue conceiving with a woman um, as he gets older, as long as his partner is younger, there are exceptions. And the sperm count does go down some and abnormalities within the sperm goes up, but men typically have millions of sperm and they can often still conceive children. If you're worried about it, uh, you could always see your doctor and explain that you're having trouble getting pregnant and ask for a sperm count. That would be the first thing to do. Okay, here's a person saying that um, her GYN wants her to try another IUI before going in a new direction. This would be the third one. I just want to stop and move forward. I feel it's a waste of time. Is it just as simple as saying no? Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, you, can, uh, you can stop what you're doing and move on. You are in charge of your health care and you don't have to subject yourself to treatments that you don't want to go through. So I hope that answers your question. Can I talk about freezing eggs versus freezing embryos? Yeah, sure. Uh, the difference, I mean, I know I showed this before, but I don't know if it, that's an egg. It's a single cell and that's the embryo that we freeze and that has hundreds of cells in it. And I showed you that picture because this, the egg, 
it's actually full of a lot of water and water is uh, difficult to freeze. So you, you, you will not have as good a survival of frozen eggs as you will of frozen embryos. The second thing is with an egg, it's one cell and that cell may not have normal chromosomes or normal machinery in it, but we can't tell that when we freeze it. So if you freeze eggs, you have a lower, I'm gonna say yield, I don't know what else to call it, um, in live births per egg than you would frozen embryos. Frozen embryos work by comparison, frozen embryos work very well. Um, just to give you some idea what I'm talking about, if you're um, under 35 and you freeze 10 eggs, you probably have something like a 50, 60% chance of one live birth. If you froze 10 embryos, you would have a much higher chance of having more than one baby with all those embryos. So they're, they're very different processes and the success rates are very different. If my husband's sperm count is low, is there anything he can try to increase it? Well, I am not a urologist. That's the specialist for male infertility. So I would be careful to get not to give too much advice about that. Um, to start with, there are some medications, there's uh, marijuana use though, and there is testosterone. If you're doing any of those things, you should stop. Um, smoking probably has a minor effect as well. There are um, antioxidant vitamins that might help, but but really it, it depends a lot on the individual situation and it depends a lot on what the count is because if the count is super low, even if you tripled it, it might still be really low. So it's a very individual situation. I can't give a lot more advice based on that question. I have another patient saying hello. So hi, uh, Brittany, congrats. Um, all right. Well, I got through all of the questions. Thank you guys all for um, logging on and watching and feel free to follow us on Instagram and call us up if you need an appointment. We're here to try to help you on your journey.